everybody. Welcome to our Advent preaching workshop, Crying Out in the Wilderness, Advent preaching in turbulent times. We're so glad that you're here today. It's nice to see so many different faces in this space. Um, a few quick logistics before we get started, and then we'll dive right in. So there are bathrooms straight out that door and through the little hallway. There are snacks that we need you to eat. And if you don't eat them, we'll need you to take them home. Um, and the way the day will go will be um, Angela Bauer-Levesque over here and Lisa Fortuna will give presentations and we'll ask some clarifying questions of them. And then we'll take a little break and we'll do some small group workshops. I let this table in the back know, and I know the rest of you might be curious, the reason they have mics is their table will be the one that is focused on during the live, for the live stream, so that the folks online still get to listen in on a workshop part, even if it's sort of a different way of participating. So they have mics. It's not because they're better or more special than you. Everyone is beloved by God in this space. So welcome, and feel free throughout the day to take care of yourself. If you need some more coffee or need to go to the bathroom, just go ahead and do that. The bathrooms, thanks Jen, are straight through this door, through the little hallway. So if you can take out your worksheet and turn it to your front page. We'll begin by reading these two little um, reflections. Che Jesus, Che Jesus. They told me that you came back to be born every Christmas. Man, you're crazy. With this stubborn gesture of coming back every Christmas, you are trying to tell us something. That the revolution that all proclaim begins, first of all, in each one's heart. That it doesn't mean only changing structures, but changing selfishness for love. That we have to stop being wolves and return to being brothers and sisters. That we begin to work seriously for individual conversion and social change that will give to all the possibility of having bread, education, freedom, and dignity. That you have a message that's called the gospel and a church, and that's us. A church that wants to be servant of all. A church that knows that because God became human one Christmas, there is no other way to love God but to love all people. That that's the way it is, Jesus. That if that's the way it is, Jesus, come to my house this Christmas. Come to my country. Come to the world of women and men. And first of all, come to my heart. And the least we can do is to make his coming not more difficult then the earth makes it for the spring when it wants to come. Amen. So on the back of that front page, there's a list of resources that you can look at on your own later. And we're going to go ahead and start our presentations off now. Thank you, Ashley. We are here this morning to explore together the gifts of the Advent lectionary in year C. Those of you who have been lectionary preaching for many years know about year C and before we jump into that, what we do here at EDS 
is have some guidelines of how we talk with each other and interact with each other. And I just want to remind all of you who know those that these are here. And I also want those of you who haven't seen them to know about them. The first one is that we agree to try on. That means that we agree to explore different ideas, different ways of looking at things without saying in advance, oh, that's not going to work, or <clears throat> that's not what I like, but to agree to try it on. And then if it doesn't fit, take it off again. Also, an important agreement is that it is okay to disagree. That's what makes for the beauty of conversation and discussion and exploration, that we are not all having the same opinions. I mean, if we are all were reading it the same way, this was like, you know, we could have nice Danish and coffee and have a good social, but we wouldn't move anywhere. And so some of the beauty of exploring texts and images, past, present, and yet to come together is the fact that we do it together and find something new. What is not okay is to blame, shame, or attack self or others. So if you don't like something somebody else says, so right not to like it, but don't attack. And I think the harder part on that one is don't at attack yourself or blame yourself for, oh, I've never seen it that way. How stupid of me, you know, kind of. That's not good for having healthy conversations. Practicing self-focus is another guideline. So we can talk about what we see, feel, read, want, wish, need. We can't make those decisions for others. Practicing both ends thinking, there is not one right way to do anything. Not, certainly not when it comes to interpretation or reading. There are so many layers to any story, any text, any word that to say, oh, there's only one way to understand that is rather limiting and not unhealthy. The guideline to notice both process and content is that they always come together. One doesn't come without the other. I mean, if you have only process without content, you're just, you know, hanging out doing small talk, but it's not moving anywhere. And if you only do content without process, always somebody gets left out or only a couple of people speak. So part of process is to hear each other into speech as we are reading texts together. Then another one <coughs> that's not just for reading texts, but for life in general, I think, is to be aware of intent and impact. We may intend something to sound a certain way, to say a certain way, it may impact somebody else very differently. And that is still our responsibility to be aware of what is the impact of our words and certainly our actions. And then the guideline of confidentiality means that this, in order to explore freely what we want to explore, this is not something that I put on Facebook, but imagine what Derek said. Derek said like all those things, and then Rosemary said something else, and I'm putting that on my Facebook? No. You know, they can put on their Facebook what they want about this, but not about somebody else again. So the interaction with people between each other 
stays here. Your learning outcomes and your excitement about and invitations to further exploration, please take them anywhere and invite and shine and relate in, by all means possible. So that's just a framework of how we do things around here at EDS these days. Hey, come on. And now let's look at the Bible together. You have the biblical texts in front of you so you don't need to look up as much. And I understand my role here today as the guide through these biblical passages in my role as professor of Bible culture and interpretation. And I will hope to paint some of the context of the passages, talk a little bit about how they positioned, because you will notice, for example, that, I mean, year Z is the Lucan year, um, that here we start on the first week at Advent with Luke 21. We don't start with Luke 1, we start with Luke 21. And obviously there is a reason for that, and we'll get to that in a minute. What you see, what the texts have all in common is in the first Advent week talking about a liminal time, talking about a time where the present is not enough, where the present is something to leave and to hope for a very different future. It is a time when the hopes of the prophets that things will get better have disappeared. It is a time when in the Hebrew scriptures as well as in the Second Testament, the New Testament, the Pauline material as well as Luke's gospel the talk is about the end time. It is the day of judgment is really coming. The days are surely coming in those days and at that time. There will be signs and then where the signs all are. And people will faint and be afraid and the foreboding and you remember that in year A you have Mark 13 in that place, you know, same, same idea. Advent 1 and thus the lectionary year starts with talking about the end times. So it is turning understanding of history upside down because the end times are something where history as we know it will disappear. I mean, before we get to Christmas, I mean, toward the end of Advent, we'll get back into the chronological time of history and at hope within history. But at the beginning, everything is up for grabs. The heaven and earth will pass away. Valleys will be made high and hills be laid low. Those are the images of turning the whole world as we know it upside down. Now, the time that and the places were the Hebrew Bible part of this takes place is like during and after the Babylonian exile. And that's kind of that shaded area here is like the Babylonian empire. And then that will give way to the Persian empire and then will give way to some others before the Roman empire in the, in the second testament. And we'll have a map of that later. 
What you'll also notice on this map, that's a map that you see every night on TV. It is, an, it is the map where, to this day, there are conflicts about land and belonging and whose end times are we looking at. And we can talk later about when we talk about the preaching topics, a little more about making the connections with the contemporary realities in this part of the world. And if you think about the migrations going on there, a way out of that shaded area into all kinds of places. And if you think about the Mediterranean as the place with the boats of the refugees, etc. By the second week of Advent, there is still some of that sense in <clears throat> the First Testament scriptures of, yes, these end times are coming, but then what these end times will bring for us, the ones who are the righteous, as the text keeps talking about, those end times will, in the turning things upside down, make things better for us, which tells you who the audience is. The audience for these end time texts are the people on the margins, that are the people at the bottom. It is not those who are well off and in power who are rejoicing in the texts that say, well, your power will be toppled, the temple will be destroyed, the Mount Zion will come down, and all of you will go and die. But no, it is bringing new life to those on the margins. Prepare the way, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple right there in Malachi, the latest of the prophetic books in the prophetic corpus. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight is coming, says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure that day of coming and who can stand when he appears? So there is that dualistic division between the ones who will be safe and the ones who will not how one preaches that message in your various congregations is a huge challenge if you preach it at all. That's why, I mean, the temptation is always at that point, let's go to the gospel. <laughs> let's not kind of dwell too long on the end times, but look at the foretelling of the rising up of a mighty Savior, which is the whole Lucan idea of salvation in continuity with the story of salvation of the Jewish people in the First Testament. I mean, Luke's congregation is clearly a mixture of Jews and newly become Christians. Some were, I'll click to the map first, in Cappadocia, Asia Minor, somewhere in that area. During what you see here in dark is the Roman Empire, the Pax Romana with all its prescriptions of status and hierarchies and why the Gospel of Luke is so interesting in regard of how it names others on the underside of history in a way that some of the earlier Gospels do not. I don't think for the purpose of this workshop, we need to talk a lot about how Luke came into being. Those of you who think that you want to explore that further probably need to go back 
to your New Testament introduction textbooks from of old or look it up somewhere with all the different theories about which part of it is Luke and which part of it is shared with Matthew and which part of it is actually the so-called Logion Q source and which part is pure Lucan material. And you can see biblical scholars go crazy over that. And you have these mix and match theories with multicolored this is this and this is that and then it jumps again. I am not too wild about that in terms of wanting to approach a text, a story in, in a lectionary because what we have there is the whole story. So it's not like we have, we can choose and say, oh, but we leave out verse four because it sounds so much like it's Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord make the path straight, every valley shall be filled, every mountain hill shall be made low. Remember that was in Isaiah, then it was in Baruch again, and it's here. So yes, you can say that is very much a wisdom pronunciation known to, hi, the spirit is blowing. Um, known to people at the time, which also tells you something about Luke in terms of audience knowing tradition. So we are looking at an audience that is educated and a mixed audience of people who have access to resources and others not so much. And the Luke's congregation is one where those who have more are constantly asked to share with those who have less. I mean, Luke is very explicit about that. So here you have the salvation side of the end days. So you have moved from the, oh, the destruction, everything will be to be afraid of, to, no, things will be made smooth, and everybody, I mean all flesh, basically saying, everybody shall see the salvation of God. So there is not so much like, only those who are on one side and only those who are on the other side, but